Okay, so um, welcome to uh, Foundations of Nursing. Um, we are starting with, uh, well, we're doing Unit 2 right now. We're going to cover assessment, communication, and patient education. The purpose of this uh, PowerPoint, voiceover PowerPoint, is simply to kind of give you an overview of the topics. Uh, it kind of gives you some direction to study um, the an idea of you know the broad topics and then it, it's your responsibility to delve deeper uh, into these topics now some of the content will be um, tested uh, some of it is is just to give you a baseline uh, to go from some of it might be repeated in class some of it won't be in class at all and so it's it's just an um a way to get you uh, started with the learning process so we're going to talk about assessment first and um you know we're talking about nursing assessment well what does nursing assessment um mean well it's one of the probably uh, most uh, important skills uh, that you can have as a nurse uh, along with communication so assessment and communication are some of the top skills that you need to uh, develop um, by developing your assessment skills um, want let me back up for a second and just say that to me what the thing about assessment is that every patient deserves a thorough assessment now when we're talking about patients uh, we're not necessarily talking about just the people you see in the hospital you might be working in a community setting a long-term care um, you know health department physician's office whatever you're going to use the skills of observation that you develop to begin gathering uh, data um, as you do more and more assessments you'll be able to pick up on things that um, you know with with just a few observations that might have taken you um, a complete head-to-toe assessment to pick up on uh, before but but that's kind of um, your goal uh, a thorough and, and skilled assessment allows you to obtain description about your patient's symptoms, how the symptoms developed, uh, and then um, through a process to discover any associated physical findings so that you can begin to develop that um, diagnosis. Now we're not, remember that as nurses we're not diagnosing um, medical problems. Uh, but we do um, have nursing diagnoses and we do need to understand how that fits into a medical diagnosis um, during the assessment you develop a rapport uh, with your patient and so again we come back to communication you, you can't your assessment is not done in a vacuum uh, it's done with the cooperation of your patient and so you have to include the patient uh, in that assessment process it is a time to find out what's going on with your patient and it is an opportune time to teach your patient as well so all of these topics blend uh, together uh, in that they can all be done uh, on the spur of the moment and uh, you know within one another I might go in to teach my patient something and realize that that I need to do an assessment of some kind to um, help the patient understand better uh, so it's the first step that we use in determining a patient's health status uh, it helps us to gather those puzzle pieces so that we can um, develop uh, the plan of care uh, 
so assessment is the first step in the nursing process and it's the first step in the development of a uh, plan of care for my my patient it helps us to get a sense of whether the patient is uh, healthy um, are they uh, you know, extremely ill, so where do they fall on that continuum? Um, every activity that you do with a, with a patient has a component of assessment. I may be just going in and giving them a Tylenol, um, but I have assessed their pain or will be assessing their pain. Um, what does that mean? And well, I'm asking them questions, I'm using my observations, and you know, th thinking what what is involved. You know, what is a, is it about their pain? But I have also assessed whether or not they can swallow that Tylenol. Uh, do I have a, a tablet when I really should have chosen a liquid? Um, you know, so there's all kinds of of assessments that we make on an ongoing basis. There's never a time that you interact with a patient that you're not doing some type of assessment. Um, even though you may not recognize it as such. So assessments are, again, allow us to gather information about the patient. Um, they help us to determine not only what is wrong, but also what's normal. Um, probably one uh, basic assessment is um, the presumption that Perhaps everyone has a bowel movement um, the same as, as you do. So maybe you're a daily um, pooper, but some people go every four to five days and that's normal for them. So we don't want to jump on, oh, they must be constipated, uh, when in fact that isn't uh, true at all. Um, but as we begin to collect this information through our assessments, then we begin to organize that data and it's this organization of the data that helps us to um, frame uh, into a um, nursing diagnosis. If we can learn to be systematic and organized in our assessment, then we can become very um, quick at it and we have better time management and better ability to to manage our patients problems uh, we also want to identify the client's strengths um, this might be in their coping mechanisms um, their support system their understanding of the disease process uh, whatever and then again it also helps us to identify those areas of teaching uh, that they have So this little cartoon here, um, I just like to add visual interest, um, but there's truth in this. Uh, we, we treat patients, not numbers. So um, no one is ever just a room number. Um, you know, it's not the COPD, COPD or in room 215. Um, it's Mr. or Mrs. So-and-so who has COPD. Um, and nothing replaces a thorough assessment um, and the joke here is using all five senses and you know so if you think of the five senses um, obviously anymore we don't necessarily taste uh, anything um, but the other four senses certainly uh, have a place in assessment and we're going to talk about those um, a little bit later. So there are, th there are different types of assessments. Um, <coughs> you'll see them labeled differently as you read different uh, sources. But we have um, what we when we typically when we 
think of an assessment, we think of the complete assessment. Now, the complete or initial assessment is the one that that encompasses the health history, um, you know, their 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 past medical, their current medical, uh, medications, surgical issues, family history, social economic uh, history, all of that stuff, as well as the physical uh, assessment that we do of the entire uh, body. So a comprehensive uh, is usually done um, when we when we first meet the patient. So this can be when they're first admitted to the hospital or we first uh, start visiting them in home health. Um, but this one is, is the idea is to get gather as much information about the patient as we can at one time. Uh, then we can have a focused or ongoing assessments. Now these are more likely to be your um, beginning of shift assessments or the patient has gone to surgery and come back and I'm going to do a, a focused assessment. You know, I'm not going to ask them all those history questions again. I may want to validate or verify some information uh, but I'm not going to ask them um, you know what surgeries they had or you know did their their father have uh, heart issues again I've asked them once I don't need to ask them them that again um, but a focused assessment or problem-based assessment or ongoing assessment typically is um, based on uh, their presenting problem so if a patient comes in with a respiratory disorder then my focused assessment is going to to be focused on uh, that area as opposed to doing a complete uh, head-to-toe um, assessment each time and then an emergency assessment obviously is when um, your something changes uh, you know suddenly the patient has a change in mental status. Well, I need to be doing a quick assessment to determine what is going on uh, that has caused that to occur. Methods of assessment, uh, typically we have observing, which is what we do with our senses. We see things in the room, um, you walk into a room and you can automatically know that the patient has or has had a respiratory um, problem because there's oxygen hooked up. Um, they have or have had bladder, so, you know, some issue with urinary output because they have a Foley hanging on the side of the bed. Um, so we use those, those powers of observation uh, to, to do some assessment sometimes without ever even uh, speaking to the patient or touching the patient. Um, interviewing, uh, an interview is a planned communication or conversation that has a purpose. Hold on. Okay, so I got interrupted and um, hopefully I can pick up where I left off. So we're talking about interviewing. Um, there are a couple of approaches to interviewing. This can be direct or uh, non-direct. So direct would be like, you know, just asking specific questions and non-directive would be picking up information through normal conversation. Um, and you're going to depend, you know, de just depends on what's going on, which uh, technique uh, you might use. And then examining is sim essentially just the uh, physical exam, um, which, you know, the systematic data collection using your observational skills. Um, and we're going to talk about myth, uh, more detail, a little bit more detail about that uh, as we go.
So the physical exam, um, if I can uh, take your, atten your attention from Ryan Gosling uh, there, uh, we would all like to do um, a head to toe, um, touchy touchy assessment, uh, I'm sure. So physical exam can be done a couple of different ways. We can do a cephalocaudal. Cephalocaudal is simply a big long word that means head to toe. Cephalo meaning head, caudal meaning end. Um, so head to toe assessment. We can do a body systems assessment, uh, which um, means you know we would break it down and do neuro assessment, musculoskeletal, cardio, uh, respiratory, uh, genital urinary, gastrointestinal. Um, so we're we're going to to focus on certain systems. We can also do uh, a problem focused assessment. Um, which is, uh, you know, an abbreviated assessment um, to, to hone in on changes in the patient condition. Um, either way, whatever physical assessment you're doing, um, you wanted to essentially do it the same uh, each time. This helps you to um, you know, if you develop a method, then you can pick up on abnormals better, and you can um, n avoid missing uh, items uh, as well. So, whether you're doing a, co a comprehensive um, head to toe or body systems assessment or you're doing a focused assessment, you're going to use some basic techniques or methods of physical assessments. And so these tools um, are inspection, palpation, percussion, and auscultation. Now typically you're going to do them in, the, in this order. Uh, the only time that you're going to uh, do them in a different order is when you're assessing the abdomen. When we're assessing the abdomen, you're going to do inspection, auscultation, then palpation and percussion. And um, this is just an example of why we, we don't want you to learn um, things in a specific order necessarily uh, when you're learning a skill. You, you need to understand <coughs> what's going on uh, behind the, the skills. So the reason for um, auscultating after inspection of the abdomen is because if I do palpation and percussion, then I'm going to stimulate the bowel and that changes the bowel sounds. So I need to do that auscultation second uh, in order to um, assess what's truly going on with the patient's bowels as opposed to what has changed because I've manipulated the bowels. So hopefully that makes a little bit of sense, but typically we're going to do um, inspection, palpation, percussion, and auscultation. Now, with inspection, uh, we, the picture shows and we typically think of inspection as visual, but I also want you to consider that inspection includes olfactory. Now, the sense of smell. Uh, it may include the sense of hearing outside of um, use of the stethoscope. Um, because I, if I walk into a room and I hear a patient um, audibly wheezing, I don't need to stop and get my, my stethoscope. I know my patient is in distress. Um, and based on that, um, auditory uh, assessment that I've just done. So I added this little um, uh, cartoon that says nurses can diagnose DKA, which is diabetic ketoacidosis, C. diff, Clostridium difficile, which is um, uh, bacteria that overgrows in the gut and causes severe diarrhea, and a GI bleed, 
uh, gastrointestinal bleed with their noses before entering a patient's room. And again, this is an observation assessment uh, based on uh, the olfactory inspection technique. Um, each of these things has um, particularly particular skills or scents that are uh, associated just with them. Uh, DKA smells fruity, um, C. diff smells foul, and GI bleed is going to smell like uh, old uh, coppery um, type of smell. Um, so these are the things that we want to um, keep in mind. Uh, so with inspection, we're using visualization. Um, uh, inspection is good for skin assessment. You need good lighting. Um, and you're going to be doing this visual inspection with every encounter that you have with the patient. Palpation, we use palpation to assess temperature of the skin, texture, moisture, mobility of the skin, um, organ size and location, rigidity or spasticity. It could be rigidity of the, of the abdomen, it could be uh, muscle rigidity. Um, so all of these things that we're going to use uh, our sense of touch. And we use different uh, aspects of our hand uh, for this palpation. So the fingertips give us information that the uh, palmar surface of our hand doesn't. And the dorsal surface of our hand gives us information that our fingertips um, don't. So we use different um, uh, aspects of our, of our hand uh, just to do this palpation. Uh, percussion is... Um, a more advanced technique and but any any technique can be learned through practice so we're gonna you know you want to practice on these but percussion helps us to un to assess underlying structures for their size location and density um, so this is when you the examiner uh, strikes their finger um, and then that elicits a sound and so the sound tells us whether the underlying structure is air-filled, fluid-filled, or solid. And then, of course, um, auscultation uh, is listening to sounds. And this can be listening with the, the stethoscope or just um, the naked ear. Um, so one of the things about using a stethoscope is that you always place the stethoscope directly to the skin. There should not be any barriers uh, between the, the skin and the stethoscope. So you have to lift the gown, you have to lift the shirt. Uh, in the case of someone who has a lot of ha body hair, uh, I may even have to shave an area in order to listen. Um, anything that is in between is going to add sounds and diminish what I hear. Now do you see nurses and physicians um, listening outside of, you know, on the outside of the shirt or gown? Yes. Um, is that ideal? Absolutely not. The other thing is they have probably listened to hundreds if not thousands of lungs and abdomens um, and they know what they hear even through that barrier but it is not best practice and I don't want to see any of you doing that Now these are some terms that you might use to describe the data that you collect. I'm not going to go through all of them, um, but these are things that you want to be familiar with um, because as you document, 
remember that someone coming to read this assessment after you're done um, it's, it's like giving directions um, when we're looking at location. Um, if, if the person I'm talking to doesn't know east from west, um, north from south, then I'm not going to be able to use those to tell them how to get somewhere. So you need to be able to know what it means when someone says that uh, the wound is proximal to the antecubital space or distal to the antecubital space or whatever. Um, you know, what is meant by subjective or objective data? What is meant by residence or wheezing? Um, so that when you document it, you know that the next person is going to have the same uh, understanding of that term. Now when we're preparing for um, an exam, um, one of the first things that you need to do before any contact with your patient is to explain what's going to happen. Uh, even something as simple as taking vital signs. Uh, if you just walk in and grab somebody's arm, um, you know, that's not a very good uh, communication um, technique. Uh, it encourages distrust. You know, they never know when somebody's going to sneak up on them. And remember that um, teaching is one of our, our primary objectives as well. Uh, so we want to communicate um, during the history and physical, be respectful and culturally sensitive uh, in our explanations and our um, techniques. Privacy, uh, when we're talking about environment, um, we need to make sure that the environment is private. So draw the curtain, close the blinds, shut the door. Uh, this is an expectation every time that you go in to do something with the patient. Um, you want to make sure the environment is warm enough uh, that the patient is, is covered appropriately so that you have access to the things you want to assess but the things you're not assessing are covered. Uh, little things like the patient being chilled and causing shivering can it cause me to assess the patient's muscle tone as firm when in fact it wasn't firm. It was simply that they were contracted somewhat uh, in an effort to warm themselves. So again, it's, it, it isn't that I want you to memorize that the environment needs to be warm. You need to understand the why. Now I may not always tell you the why. You need to um, determine what the why is but there's a reason behind what you're being told. You need to understand that reason. If you don't understand that reason, then you need to ask and find out what is the reason behind um, making sure that the, the environment is warm. Uh, infection control is uh, something that we really want to um, keep in mind for every time we, we walk into the patient room. So one of the first things that, you know, before you walk in that room or you, before you get very far, you're going to do hand hygiene. And whether that's with uh, soap and water at the sink or alcohol-based foam, whatever. Uh, all patients should be, um, you know, we should use standard precautions when in contact with all patients. So when should I wear gloves? When shouldn't I wear gloves? Uh, if there's any risk of contact with body fluids, wear gloves. Wash your hands before and after uh, using those gloves. Um, make sure you have all of the equipment that you need. Uh, so uh, vital sign machine, um, pin light, reflex hammer, uh, you know, just depends on what kind of assessment are you going to do. At the very minimum, you're going to need a watch with a second hand and a stethoscope. You may need um, 
and a pin light. Th those are the, the three basic tools that you need to have available at all times. Um, and then, you know, reflex hammer, tuning fork are additional pieces of equipment uh, that you might need. Make sure the room is well lit, but that is not over bright and causing the patient uh, discomfort. Um, I wanted to give you a word about stethoscopes. Um, there are lots of different types of stethoscopes. Most are acoustic. They have different parts. Uh, the earpieces, which should fit snugly in your ears. The binaurals, which are the metal tubes that form a kind of an L shape and are attached to the earpieces. Um, you can reposition those and they you should be those should be positioned so that the earpieces are pointed towards your nose. This makes sure that the sound is projected on the tympanic membrane. Make sure the tubing is not too long, 12 to 18 inches is adequate. Yes, it means you get a little closer to your patient, but you're going to hear a lot better as well. You also want to make sure that the tubing is free, that it's not banging against anything, uh, it's not brushing against the gown or your arm or your clothing or whatever, because this um, adds sounds that interfere with you hearing correctly. The head typically has two parts. Um, it has the diaphragm, which is flat, and should be held firmly against the skin and the bell which is has a hollow in it and should be held lightly against the skin. Um, the diaphragm is used for high-pitched sounds of the lungs and the bowel and normal heart sounds. You should always stabilize it between your index and middle fingers. Avoid putting your thumb or anything um, on top of the piece that you're not using uh, because you may pick up uh, again extraneous sounds. The bell is used for low pitch sounds like abnormal heart sounds, murmurs, uh, vascular sounds. So if I was going to listen to say the carotid artery to see if there was uh, any brewy then I would use the, the bell. Um, the bell is held lightly because if I press tightly then it becomes like a diaphragm uh, because of the occlusion. It doesn't allow the vibration of the air. Um, a point of infection control, I haven't seen these a lot recently, but for a while the stethoscope koozies, the, the cloth covers, um, those are not okay. They are an infection control risk, so we're going to avoid using those as well. Now positioning, you have a handout on Inside NC that um, shows different positions for different um, types of assessments and you want to kind of familiar si familiarize yourself uh, with that. So uh, overall that's kind of the um, basic uh, quick overview of assessment. I know it's really not that quick at, at 30 minutes, but um, once you've done your assessment and you've learned to do an adult assessment, then you adapt that assessment to infants, children, and elderly, um, looking for age-specific considerations so that you can um, adjust your plan of care. Once you've done your assessment and you have this um, health history and, and your uh, data from your, your physical exam, um, then you analyze this data and put it together to form your patient problems and begin to develop your plan of care. Now assessment doesn't stop just because you've developed a plan of care assessment is always going to be ongoing. You're going to reassess and reassess. Uh, this may be to determine if your goal was met. 
uh, maybe because the patient condition ch has changed. But you need to know if what you're doing is working. And if it isn't working, then you've you, you know, you've done your reassessment and you change what you're doing to make it work. Um, so the ability, your ability to efficiently and effectively obtain a health history and physical exam will ensure that the appropriate plan of care is done. All right, so if you need a break, this is a good place to take a break. Now we're talking a little bit about concept mapping. Um, you've been introduced to the idea of mind mapping, and this isn't a whole lot different, uh, except that we're going to be using all patient data as opposed to uh, topics such as oxygenation or um, myocardial infarction. We're using uh, patient data that we've collected. So the concept map um, allows us to uh, sort that data uh, in order to begin to develop the different patient problems that we're dealing with. And it's here where we start looking at subjective data, um, objective data, primary sources of data, secondary sources of data, um, and then we start organizing or clustering the data uh, into groups of information that help us identify this, the patterns of health or the patterns of illness that my patient is exhibiting. Oh my God. Hang on. Okay, so sorry about that. That happens all the time. Um, so we've collected our data and we've started to cluster it. Um, this is a good time for us to validate the data. Now, what does it mean to validate? It's simply that we're double checking. We're verifying uh, that the data is accurate. Thank you. So what is a concept map? Well, like a mind map, it's a kind of a web diagram that helps us to gather and share and connect uh, information. Uh, it consists of, of blocks of information um, with links. Now, the links are really important. We don't want to have um, these isolated pieces of information. Uh, we want to group this information that's alike, and then how does it relate to or connect with this group of information over here? Uh, because sometimes a piece of information um, that I've collected on my patient goes with more than one patient problem. And so I may use one piece of data in three or four places because it's pertinent to that um, problem or, you know, it's, it supports that problem. Um, the links explain the relationship. If I have a patient with um, impaired gas exchange because they have pneumonia and they have a lot of thick mucus, um, and I also know from my data that they have an ineffective cough, so I've got impaired gas exchange and I've got impaired airway clearance. Uh, those are linked um, because the inability to clear the airway is part of what's causing the impaired gas exchange. If I can't get air in or out, then I don't get fresh gases to exchange. Um, the arrows describe the, the direction of the relationship. So in the case of impaired gas exchange and ineffective airway clearance, the arrow would go both ways. Um, one is causing the other and one is, is, you know, a result of. So it might go both ways. Now at the bottom here, I've got a couple of different uh, examples of um, concept mapping and, uh, or mind mapping. And so on the, the left-hand side, we've got bread. And this is very simple. 
um, representation of a concept map. But bread is made of wheat. Now we could have oats or we could have rice or we could have whatever there. And it grows in a field. Now I could take that further and have arrows coming off a field. Um, I could have um, arrows coming from wheat. You know, maybe I, I need milk or I need it to be wheat to be made into flour. So there's additional things that I could add. But this is the basic concept of bread. Then in the middle, we have a very well-developed uh, concept map. Lots of ideas um, and connections are made. Uh, so you see we have this central idea and um, from that we begin the spokes of the wheel. So I've got these separate satellite ideas and how do they relate to the middle concept and how do they relate uh, to each other and each one of those has things going off of it and so this is a more detailed concept map but on the right is the basic idea I have this concept this problem and I have these ideas or words that link to the concept so again if I had a patient with ineffective airway clearance um, I would expect to see um, spu sputum production what does my sputum look like is it thick um, do they have an ineffective cough uh, you know what what are their uh, ABGs like their oxygen saturation their respiratory rate all of these things um, you know we, I need are connecting to it uh, what is the definition of in ineffective airway clearance um, so that all leads me to uh, what is a concept uh, map. So we're just clustering this data uh, so that we can determine what the patient problem is that then leads us to a nursing diagnosis that leads us to um, nursing interventions that leads us then to resolution of the patient problem. All right, so now we're going to talk about communication. And um, communication is multifaceted. Lots of things, you, you know, we don't normally think about it on a day-to-day -day basis. What does communication um, involve? We just, we just communicate, and it's easy because we have a set of rules, if you will, uh, that we've all grown up with. And <clears throat> these are the things that we have to think about that not all of our patients have grown up with the same set of rules. They, maybe because they speak a different language or from a different culture, um, it may be because they're sick. Um, you know, so all these things that we, we have to consider. One of the main things about uh, communication in nursing is that it is one of the most important things that we do. We have to establish a therapeutic relationship with our patients. And I would say that we have to go beyond just our patients and establish a therapeutic relationship with our peers. And our peers aren't just other nurses. Our peers are anyone we work with physical therapy occupational therapy nurse aides housekeeping dietary physicians pharmacy and um, we have to have a therapeutic relationship with all of these people in order to provide the best patient care possible when we talk about a therapeutic relationship um, it's a purposeful use of self um, in all our professional relationships. Um, so we're going to respect the dignity of the client and ourselves. We're using person-centered communication 
and we're going to be authentic in our conversations. Professional therapeutic relationships have boundaries, they have a purpose, and they have specific behaviors. Boundaries keep the, the relationship safe. Um, we don't become too intimate, and yet we're not too aloof with our patients. They, they spell out a beginning and an end to re the relationship. So the relationship lasts only as long as I have a professional responsibility to that person. There are different phases of a, of a therapeutic uh, relationship that, you know, regarding communication. So we have pre-interaction. Um, this is when, um, before I've seen the patient. So I get to know a few things, you know, what are they here for, their age, you know, um, what's been done so far. Then I have the orientation phase. Um, this is when I've introduced myself and I begin to establish those roles. I'm your nurse today, or I'm your student nurse today. I'm going to be working with so-and-so. Um, these are the things I'm going to be doing for you. What would you, what would you like to have done today? Uh, so you start to establish the um, guidelines for the relationship. And the working phase is the problem solving phase. Um, it parallels the planning and implementation phase of the nursing process. So, um, you know, I s this is fairly simplistic and it might not be something I actually say, but, you know, if I go into a room and the patient is um, having difficulty breathing, I see you're having difficulty breathing, what would you like to have done? Um, Obviously, they want to have their breathing uh, improved. So I'm going to set the head of your bed up. That will help you breathe a little easier. Let me check your oxygen. Um, let me help you take some slow, easy breaths. You know, whatever. Um, so that I'm communicating um, and not um, dictating. And then finally, uh, we have the uh, termination phase. And this is... Um, when uh, the relationship ends. Uh, so um, I'm going off shift, uh, a new nurse will be taking care of you now, or um, you're well enough to not need home health care anymore, uh, or we'll see you uh, next time at, at in the office, you know, whatever. When you see people outside of the health care environment uh, you have to remember they need to in, you need to allow them to initiate any conversation uh, you cannot uh, go up to them and say you know how are you doing since you were in the hospital uh, you know maybe the people around them don't know they were in the hospital so if they bring something up you you know you can talk to them about it but the most you can do is act like they're a casual acquaintance. Hi, how you doing? Um, and uh, only address those things that they lead you uh, into. I hope that kind of makes sense. So, um, you know, you want to be aware of what, what your boundaries are um, and not violate. The other thing to be aware of is therapeutic use of self. Um, it's, you know, the relationship, therapeutic relationship is not just what you do, um, but it also is who you are in relation to the clients and the families. Um, we can use ourselves to form the relationship with the person that we're giving care to, um, but you want to avoid being too intimate um, and giving too much detail. Um, you don't want to detract from uh, what the patient is going through. Um, and you don't want it to come across as if your experience was better or worse um, or that you have all the answers. 
you want to make sure that your conversation, your communication is authentic. Um, so to do this, you have to be aware of what your personal values are, what your strengths and limitations are, what your vulnerable vulnerabilities is, are. Um, sometimes we're not aware until we get into the middle of something that this was going to be an issue uh, for us. Um, and it might be best, you know, at that point to to find a break, a way to break and um, gather your thoughts together. Uh, and then, of course, presence uh, involves being in the moment. You've heard about presence before. Um, it's not something that is tangible. However, when it's not there, it is recognizable that it's missing. You need to be there, be in the moment, be with the client or the patient. It's a connection um, that the patient and family will experience. <clears throat> and you have to constantly scrutinize yourself. Um, so, you know, reflect on your behavior so that you can determine if you did um, the best job possible in any given situation. Uh, so therapeutic communication is communication as a component of therapy. There are many different ways to be therapeutic. Um, active listening is probably the most important. Um, when we actively listen, we're not just hearing the words that people say. We're listening to their tone of voice, uh, their actions, their demeanor, their behavior. Um, you know, sometimes we have to be, to clarify, I hear you say you're fine. I'm seeing that maybe you're not, you know. So sharing your observations. I see that you seem sad, um, you know, without, um, being brutal sharing empathy hope humor and feelings now a word about humor um, it can be well received and it can be poorly received sometimes it's the manner in which we use the humor um, we don't use the same humor with patients that we use with each other uh, nurses tend to develop a black humor um, and that's kind of a self, um, what do I want to say? Um, it, it allows us to protect our self-protecting mechanism, I guess. Um, I'll give you an example of inappropriate humor. Um, it was a change of shift and I was um, coming on in the middle of a delivery. So I went into the room and the off-going nurse was um, standing at the bedside. The doctor is sitting there, the husband's on the other side, and the nurse is talking to the doctor. Now obviously the patient has been pushing and the husband has been there and they've, they've been together all day, but the nurse is talking to the doctor. And, and this is something that always bothers me is when we have side conversations um, did you go to that party last night? Have you seen that movie? And the patient feels like, you know, they're the third wheel. That's not okay. But in this instance, the, the nurse told a joke, asked the doctor if he wanted to hear a joke. And she told the joke, um, and it was very inappropriate um, for the situation. And so... I quickly took over for her and asked her to go ahead and be done. Uh, so again, you just want to be sure that your humor is appropriate. Um, touch. Touch can be touchy. Uh, a lot of nurses are um, touchy-feely people. Um, remember that you want your touch to be therapeutic. It needs to 
um, convey warmth and caring without being too intimate. We want to make sure that um, it's culturally appropriate, that um, we are touching people. If someone draws back or flinches away, then we need to take that cue that touch is, is possibly not okay uh, for them. And, uh, you know, keep that uh, in mind. Eye contact is another one of those things that um, can be a culturally sensitive uh, issue. Um, those of us who are westernized um, see eye contact as uh, confident, um, assertive. But eye contact can be aggressive uh, and in some cultures uh, it's insulting. So we have to be very um, aware of that. We can also use non-therapeutic communication techniques. So just as important as knowing what to do is knowing what not to do. Um, this can be verbal or nonverbal uh, communication, you know, the words we use or the gestures that we use. <coughs> so you want to be aware of non-therapeutic communication and avoid that. So communication can be verbal or nonverbal. Verbal is what we say. It's the words that we use and it's our tone of voice. Um, Nonverbal are is our gestures um, and somewhat our tone of voice, our facial expressions. Um, you can see the little box that says non nonverbal gestures, facial expressions, postures, eye contact. Uh, paralinguistics, which is the the tone, and appearance. How you know what what you look like um, can say a lot um, about you. So we have to be aware. Does our nonverbal communication match our verbal communication? And I always think about the um, cell phone commercials. I don't even remember what cell phone company it was or anything, but um, where the mother gives the daughter a cell phone and the daughter stomps up the stairs and angrily says um, I love you and the mom is standing at the bottom and says I know you really mean that their, their words and their um, nonverbal don't match so which are you going to believe well people will most often believe the nonverbal communication before they believe the verbal now, a lot of people aren't, can't tell you why they, they don't believe something, um, but they're picking up on that nonverbal uh, communication. So, words mean very little uh, when it comes to communication. It's our presentation that truly means a lot. Um, the process of, of communication we usually have a sender that gives a message and then a receiver who takes in the message and gives us feedback. In, mo in a lot of situations, especially say at the beginning of a shift, you're the sender. You're the one going in with um, an agenda, you might say, and you're, you're giving the message. It's your responsibility to make sure that the receiver, the patient, has gotten your message appropriately. Uh, so uh, keep all of these things in mind. Now we can apply the nursing process to everything because it's basically the scientific process. We're going to assess the situation, come up with a problem, design a plan, implement the plan, and then evaluate how we did. But here's some things that influence communication. Um, 
your roles and relationships. Um, so we, we communicate differently with the patient than we do with the nurse working beside us, than we do with the physician, and, and that's okay. Uh, that's to be expected. Uh, we all have personal space. This is a cultural difference as well, that personal space is different in different cultures. We have a safe zone that is three to four feet typically, and then a personal zone that is usually less than a foot and a half. We also have territoriality. How many of you are anxious that when you go to back to class, you're not going to be in the same spot you were in? Or you always wanted to sit at the same computer to test? That's territoriality. And we all have that. It's innate uh, sense of this is my space. Um, I don't test well if I'm not in this space. Well, the fact of the matter is that I could test just as well if I were used to that spot, maybe. Uh, the person's development, um, you know, this can go along with their age, um, unless they're not, their development isn't age appropriate. And um, so, you know, what is their development? Where are they developmentally? What are their values and perceptions? Um, you know, if, if they uh, have different values than you, uh, communication might be, might be more difficult. Gender differences in communication. Uh, we're all aware of that there are d gender differences and we have to work to uh, overcome those. Uh, the environment, is the environment loud? Is it quiet? Is it uh, conducive to communication? Is it congruent? Um, are we communicating using, you know, are we using the same words but they have different meanings? Um, I always think of ridiculous. Uh, when people start started using the word ridiculous to mean something good, I, I had a hard time with that because to me ridiculous means um, not good. It, it, you know, if something is ridiculous, it's crazy, it's dumb, it's, it's not valid. Uh, and now um, the word ridiculous, you know, can mean um, awesome. And so, you know, there can be some incongruence there. Um, the word code. In healthcare, when we say we had a code, that means that someone had to have CPR and, um, you know, we're usually talking about a code blue. Uh, in um, information technology or something like that, uh, a code might mean binary code, so the ones and zeros, ones and zeros. Well, that means something different, you know. Um, in uh, the armed forces, code might mean a code of honor. It might mean Morse code. Uh, so again, one word can have so many different meanings that I need to make sure that we're all, on, you know, we're all on the same page. And then probably interpersonal attitude is one of the biggest things. What is your attitude? Um, are you happy to be here today? Uh, are you angry about something outside of work? Um, you know, are you having negative self-talk? Those things can impact your ability to communicate effectively with a patient. So education then is a result of assessment. I've assessed my patient. Uh, they have diabetes. Um, they haven't been doing their blood sugars correctly or their diet correctly or whatever. And so I realized that they need some education. I've determined that through my assessment. Well, it requires communication in order to uh, educate my patient. Now, some things we need to know before we can educate our patient, uh, domains of learning. Um, so there's three primary domains of learning, cognitive, which are mental skills. Well, what impacts cognitive or mental skills? This could be IQ, IQ uh, level of education, 
um, language barriers um, is going to affect cognitive skills. If, if I have a patient that reads at a fifth grade level, then I'm probably not going to take an article out of a medical journal uh, for them to read. Uh, if they don't read English, then a, a pamphlet uh, written in English is, is absolutely no good either. Affective or feelings and emotional uh, or and attitude skills. Uh, this is the probably the the most difficult domain of learning uh, to teach, um, but it affects whether or not the patient is ready to learn. Um, if they have a new colostomy and they're feeling very negative toward it, their affective domain is not at a point where they're ready to learn. And then the psychomotor, which is manual or physical skills. Um, this is where we teach them to um, give themselves insulin or, or change their ostomy bag or, or whatever. Um, we have to consider what what are their physical capabilities? Um, do they have poor eyesight? Then we're going to have to come up with a way that they can see that insulin syringe. Um, are they missing uh, three fingers on one hand? You know, are they going to be able to manipulate that bag uh, to get it on appropriately? These domains of, of learning also apply to you as students. Um, you have to learn things in all three uh, domains as well. So some other things that we want to address or think about is uh, the attentional set. How long can my patient pay attention to what I have to teach? It's typically better to have frequent small or short teaching sessions than one long teaching, teaching session. Um, if you've watched this whole thing uh, without a break, at this point you probably are pretty brain dead. Um, it's in direct proportion to how numb your bum is. Um, if your bum is numb, your brain is numb. So what is the patient's attentional set? You know, think of it in terms of age. Um, a three-year-old is not going to pay attention very long um, as compared to, say, a 30-year-old. Now we all know 30-year-olds who attention span is is less than a three-year-old's but it gives you a benchmark a guide what is their motivation to learn your personal motivation to learn is to attain um, your nursing degree get your nursing license and practice nursing to the best of your capabilities but patients don't always have a tangible motivation um, this is true when we're looking at um, patients who smoke, uh, who don't take their medications appropriately, um, don't change their diet, or you know whatever. What is their motivation to learn? Um, we have to help them find that in order to be successful. Uh, what is their psychosocial adaptation to the illness? Um, have they accepted the illness? That's going to go a long way to their motivation. If they're still in denial, I don't have diabetes, then they're not going to be motivated to learn. And then active participation, um, the more I involve the patient in the teaching, what do you, you know, ask the patient, what do you want to know about this disease? What do you want to know about what's going on with you? Um, if I get that out of the way, then they're more likely to listen to the things that I think is, are important as well. So again, I have to do an assessment. What is their level of education? What is their previous knowledge about whatever I'm teaching them about? What nursing diagnosis would be appropriate? What kind of goal do I have? does the patient have? What does the patient want to know? How am I going to teach them this? Am I going to show them a video? Am I going to give them a pamphlet? Am I going to do a song and dance? Do I want them to, you know, am I going to show them how to do it and I want them to return the demonstration? And then 
how did all that work? Did I meet my goal? Did I get um, accomplished what needed to be accomplished? So that's the end. I know it's pretty long and I apologize for that. Um, but hopefully that will guide you um, in your, your studying process and you can start thinking about some of these things. Do some of the, the reading, do some of the handouts on Inside NC and then you will um, be prepared for uh, interactive class time and walk away with even more uh, information. So thanks for listening.